Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I want to give you an overview of virus genomes and then a little bit of genetics, what we can do with these genomes. And this will be information that we'll use throughout the rest of the course. Now, before we do that, an issue from last time, the numbers on this MOI table, so I recalculated them. And this one was the issue here. It wasn't adding up to 100. So one of these numbers wasn't correct. I just went back to the original formula. It was slightly off. And these are the right numbers. If you, in fact, uh, a million cells at an MOI of 0.001, 99.9% of the cells are uninfected. 0.099% get one particle, and then 0.001% more than one. It doesn't add up to uh, 100 because there's some um, decimals way out that have been rounded off. But the point here is that when you put a very low MOI, most of the cells are uninfected, OK? <clears throat> So today we're going to talk about the genome, the genetic information of viruses. And if you remember, in the 1950s, we learned that the nucleic acid is the genetic code for the virus. That was done by the Hershey Chase experiment with phage T4, which we talked about, the blender experiment. And it also came about a bit later uh, in that decade with work on tobacco mosaic virus. We'll talk about that a bit later on today. The big surprise, of course, as we studied more and more viruses, there were many, many of them, thousands of different kinds of viruses. It turned out there were only a finite number of viral genomes, and that's the magic number seven that I want you to remember, because if you remember seven, then you can figure out basically how many different kinds of viral genomes there are. So there are seven genome types. And for viruses, they can be either RNA or DNA. They come in many different forms, as you've already seen, and we'll go into a bit more today. The variety of genomes that you find in viruses is much greater than in any, other, uh, any of the other kingdoms. And I subscribe to the three kingdom uh, classification, bacterial, archaeal, and eukaryotic kingdoms. They all mostly have DNA genomes, double-stranded DNA. Viruses have many, many more different ones. Studying these genomes over the years has been very fruitful because we've learned how to decode them, and we've learned much more from that than just by studying the double-stranded DNA of most other organisms. So here are the, here's the diversity of structures. This goes beyond the seven genome types because here we're talking about linear, circular, segmented, gapped as distinct entities, you know, plus or minus, single-strand, ambisense, which we haven't talked about, we will today, double-stranded. Some of the genomes have proteins covalently linked to them. Uh, some of them, the ends are cross-linked. Some of them have covalently attached RNA. So a lot of different configurations. But in the end, there are only seven different genome types. Now, an itch, a question you might be interested in is, what does this diversity mean? Is it significant that we have both DNA and RNA and all different kinds of forms of both? Can you tell something about evolution from this diversity? And I guess the main question is, is one configuration advantageous versus another? And maybe more interesting to all of you is, do you have to memorize it all? So the purpose of having a, a given structure as far as I can see, since we have all seven genome types and many configurations of each, that means they all have some kind of selective advantage in whatever their niche is. They all work, so they're all there. So I don't, I don't see there's any particular selective advantage for any typical genome type. Uh, what is clear, though, is that uh, the genome is really a, a reflection of how it's packaged into the particle, how it's replicated. So you will see in ensuing lectures that as we talk about the replication of these genomes, their configuration will make sense. So you'll understand why there are circular double-stranded DNA genomes, for example. So selective advantage, I'm not sure there is any. They all work. But there are reasons to having particular compositions. Let's take a broader look. Let's say, why, is there, why are there RNA viruses? Because all other life forms or other entities on Earth have DNA genomes. 
why is there RNA? So we have an idea about this, and that is the hypothesis of the RNA world that supposedly existed first when life first evolved. The idea was it evolved as RNA-based life forms. And so today, the only RNA-based forms are viruses. So at some point, there was a switch from an RNA-based form of life to a DNA-based form of life. And the RNA viruses are relics, really, of that ancient time. There is some evidence for this, but it's by no means easy to prove that this is what happened. So an answer as to why there are both DNA and RNA viruses is, while the RNA viruses are relics, and the DNA viruses emerged later on when they were DNA-based lice forms. And then, of course, the answer to do you have to memorize it, some of it you do, and I think at the least you should know this. This is actually quite easy because you start with the seven genome types and then you figure out how they reach mRNA. And once you do that, you have a lot figured out. So you should know the seven genome types, the single gapped and double-stranded DNA, and all the different kinds of RNA, and how they get to messenger RNA. That's really important. So you should understand that single-stranded DNA can't be transcribed into mRNA. So you have to first make it double-stranded. In fact, the only thing that can be transcribed for DNA is double-stranded DNA. So if I give you a gapped uh, double-stranded DNA, you have to fill it in first. So you should know all these pathways, and we'll be talking about them over and over, so it shouldn't be difficult. I also want you to know some... Yes? Why can't um, a plus RNA just be used as if it were mRNA? Why can't a plus... This is the first time I remembered to repeat the question. <laughs> Why can't a plus RNA... Uh, be used as if, as if it were a plus mRNA. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is, as we will see um, here. For the purposes of this diagram, this is tracing the whole flow of information. So as you will see in a moment, some plus strand RNA viruses can be directly translated. But eventually you have to make more of it, and then you have to go through a negative intermediate. So that's what's being shown here. Uh, so I'd like you to know some examples. We're going to use for this course prototypical viruses as examples to illustrate things, and eventually you'll get to know them pretty well. So if I show you a double-stranded RNA, you're going to know right away that real viruses have double-stranded RNA genomes, and they cause gastroenteritis. We'll get to that later in the course. Uh, there are not many viruses that will ask you to remember in this way. So, for example, a double-stranded DNA linear would be an adenovirus, the virus with the Sputnik type things. Okay. So, let's talk first in general terms. What, what does a genome of a virus encode? This is pretty obvious. It encodes uh, proteins that you need to replicate the genome. This varies from virus to virus. Every virus encodes at least one protein involved in replication. Some encode all the proteins involved in replication. We'll see that later on. You have to make proteins to make the virion particles, of course, and to put the genome into the particle. For the bigger viruses, you'll see in this, as we discuss this, as the genomes get bigger, they can encode more things. And the bigger DNA viruses can encode proteins that control the timing of the replication cycle. Typically, the small viruses don't do that. They don't have enough coding space. But the bigger viruses do. Every virus genome has to encode at least one protein that modulates host defenses. Otherwise, the virus doesn't exist because it would be cleared by the host. And some viruses encode only one, and some encode dozens of these uh, modulatory proteins. And then there are proteins that help the virus to spread from one cell to another, or maybe even from one host to another. So the, we'll talk about some of these in specific terms uh, a bit later on. What about what is not encoded in a genome? This is almost as important. No genes encoding the complete protein synthesis machinery. So when I started teaching this course just a couple years ago, that sentence said, no genes encoding the protein synthesis machinery. Then, then Mimi viruses were discovered that have tRNA synthetase encoding genes in them, so we modify it. Who knows, maybe one day I take the sentence out completely. 
but for now, no virus encodes a complete protein synthesizing machinery. So viruses are parasites of the host in that sense. They need to use the host translational machinery. No virus encodes proteins that can make energy or membranes or attach uh, sugars to, to proteins and a, and a number of other things. The cell is, has to do all of that. There's no, uh, no, no transport systems. The cell has to provide that as well. There are no centromeres or telomeres as we know them in host chromosomes. But again, this is, a, this is a list that's dynamic and it could change next year because we simply haven't found them yet. All right, so back to the key fact that really, I think, clarifies a lot for you. Just think of mRNA as the central goal for these viral genomes, because the mRNA has to be read by host ribosomes. So every genome that we're going to talk about has to somehow get to mRNA. So even though it seems complicated, even seven genome types may seem a lot. If you can just say, go from that to mRNA, it'll help you. Yes? Are there viruses that use mitochondrial DNA replication systems? Is that the question? I don't know of any. Uh, but there could be. Maybe we haven't found them yet. I don't see why not. But I don't know of any that would get into the mitochondrion, which would be necessary to do that. All right, back to the Baltimore scheme. This is, what the, this is the Baltimore scheme. So if I say this, you don't know what I'm talking about. It's just this scheme of the seven genome types and how they get to mRNA. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go through each of these genome types and give you some examples of prototype viruses and how the flow of information occurs. And then in subsequent lectures, we're going to explore this in more detail. So this is kind of an overview of what happens. Now, as we do this discussion, there are some conventions you need to know because I'll use them. And if you don't know what they mean, you're going to get confused. So these are other things you should know. But this is pretty simple. It's intuitive. Perhaps the only thing that's not intuitive is that mRNA is the plus strand, because that's just a randomly assigned convention years ago. So you'll have to remember that. mRNA is always the plus strand. And if we have a DNA, a double-stranded DNA molecule, and one of those is the plus strand, of course, that's the equivalent in polarity as mRNA. And the complements of the plus are just the minus strands. Right. One year, someone wanted to know if this had to do with polarity or charged electricity. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's just a convention. Could have used alpha and beta or gamma, delta, whatever, but they settled on plus and minus. So mRNA, the definition of mRNA is that it's ready to be translated by a ribosome. And then finally, maybe this is a bit confusing. Not all plus RNA is mRNA because there are some viruses that have a plus strand uh, RNA genome, but it's not translated into protein. So it, you can't always assume that just because something is plus that it's going to be a messenger RNA. But mRNA is always the plus strand. That's clear. And I will point out the, the exceptions to you as, as we go through these. Now here is another way of arranging the seven genome types, which I think is also useful. It's slightly different. It helps you to understand the relationships between them. And here, uh, we've classified them, the different genomes, by replication strategies. So first here, this group of three, remember there are seven genome types, this group of three are RNA viruses that go from RNA to RNA to RNA. They replicate their genomes through RNA intermediates. So that's what this means, RNA to RNA to RNA. And here we have the negative strand RNA viruses, the double-stranded RNA viruses, and the plus-stranded. RNA viruses, all right? So they all go through RNA intermediates. Uh, over on the right, we have DNA viruses that go from DNA to DNA to DNA. They just replicate their deno genomes via DNA intermediates. Here we have single-stranded DNA genomes and double-stranded. OK, that's straightforward. And then in the middle are the unusual ones, because they are the so-called reverse transcribing viruses. They go through. Uh, the opposite intermediate. So our, the retroviruses have plus strand RNA genomes, and they, they go through a DNA intermediate. The hepatitis B viruses 
have a DNA genome, and they go through an RNA intermediate. So it's basically switching back and forth depending on the virus. So these are reverse transcribing viruses that alternate between RNA and DNA depending on what virus. So if you just remember that the two members of this are retroviruses and hepatitis B virus, you should know that the retroviruses have a, an RNA genome, and it must, if it's a retrovirus, it goes through a DNA intermediate. So this is a good supplement to the Baltimore scheme. So what I suggest is that you start thinking about these seven genome types. I think probably most of you could recite them all right now. Um, don't wait to the last minute. Just keep thinking about them. And the idea is, if I say double-stranded DNA, how do you get to mRNA? You should be able to know that. For double-stranded DNA, it's easy. It's one step to mRNA. So you should be able to know how mRNA is made from the genome. That's what I mean. If I give you uh, a gapped double-stranded DNA, you would tell me, okay, you fill in the gaps, make it double-stranded, then you make mRNA. That's what I mean by know how mRNA is made from the genome. And then finally, how the genome is copied to make more genomes that we will get an overview of today, and you'll learn about that in very specific lectures later on. So let's start with DNA, vi viruses with DNA genomes. And as you all know, our genetic system and whatever host for any virus is based on DNA. And for the most part, DNA viruses emulate the host in replicating their genomes. You'll see many of them use the host DNA replication system. Um, others don't, and some of them modify them. But for the most part, almost all the viral DNA genomes that we're going to talk about are not like cell chromosomes. If you've learned about those in some other course, you know there are very specific ways to put together a cell chromosome with nucleosomes and so forth. There are some uh, viral genomes that are nucleosomed, but none of them are really exactly like a cell chromosome. Now, because virus DNA genomes occur in different configurations, they have to overcome difficulties in replication. So they've evolved unexpected tricks, like having a circular DNA genome is one way to get around the end problem, as you will see. And here are our prototypical mammalian viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes. So there are many, many other viruses that infect insects and plants and other bacteria. These are, we're going to just focus for this discussion on the mammalian viruses. And these are the ones, one, two, three, four, five, six families. You can tell these are families because they have a DAE, Vira-D, at the end. You could also say the adenovirus family. Either way would be correct. So we have adenoviruses, first of all, and they're these really unusual ones that look like a satellite. I grew up uh, when Sputnik was first put up there. In fact, I, was, I remember when it was launched, and we thought actually we could see it floating in the sky. So if none of you know what Sputnik is, <laughs> I will understand that. But this to us will always be a Sputnik. Uh, that's adenovirus. It has a double-stranded DNA genome. Hepadenoviruses uh, has the unusual gapped DNA genome. And in this icon, you'll be able to recognize that, I think, eventually. Herp Sorry. What part? What part? That it has an unusual gapped DNA genome, and we're going to look at that structure. And whenever you see this icon, you'll, be, you'll recognize it. It's the only family we talk about with an unusual gapped uh, double-stranded DNA genome. And then we have herpes viruses. So the best way you can remember these are they're, they're Dr. Silverstein's favorite viruses, because right, he worked on those for many years. And they're the big ones. So he's a big guy, and he worked on a big virus. And uh, there it is there. There's a lot of junk in the, in the virion, a lot of junky proteins, but they're important. So that's very different from all the other ones. And then we have two families of, of circular double-stranded DNA viruses. Papillomaviruses, really important human papillomaviruses. We'll talk about them and their disease and the vaccines. And polyomaviruses, also small double-stranded DNA viruses, which, which have some important pathogens as well. They have a very generic kind of capsid. We'll, we'll learn about this uh, later. It's an icosahedral capsid. It's hard to distinguish one from the other. And then finally, the pox viruses. Uh, the, uh, the, among these, the largest of this group of viruses with a very unusual brick shape. 
and a large double-stranded DNA genome. Okay, so those are our prototype viruses and double-stranded DNA. So let's take a look at the genomes of some of these viruses. Um, we, we, I'm, I've grouped them into two broad categories, those virals, viruses with genomes that are copied by the host DNA polymerase. So, you know, we have DNA polymerase in our cells to copy our genomes. And these viruses with small genomes take advantage of that. They can't really, they don't really have the coding space to encode a DNA polymerase. So they depend on the host cell. And examples of those are the polyomaviruses and the papillomaviruses. They have small, you know, 5 KB. You don't have to know the size. Just, I'm just telling you this for reference. Small double-stranded DNAs that are circles. All right, and then we don't have that in our, maybe in our mitochondria we have that, but for the most part, most organisms do not have that configuration. And these are replicated by the host DNA polymerase. On the right are the bigger DNA viruses, adeno, herpes, pox. They have bigger genomes. You can see 36 to 48, 120 to 220 kilobase pairs, 130 to 375. So they have extra room, and um, these encode a DNA polymerase. You'll hear more about this later. So these are all double-stranded DNAs. You can see this is circular. These are linear. So how does the information flow work? You start with double-stranded DNA in these virions. Whether it's linear or circular it can be transcribed by RNA polymerase. You can make messenger RNA right from it. All right. And you will learn where this happens in the cell. It's another comp important component of your knowledge uh, for all of these viruses. They have to get into the nucleus with the exception of the pox viruses which does everything in the cytoplasm, but you'll hear more about that later. You make mRNA directly from the double-stranded DNA, and then from that, of course, you can make proteins, which you need to make virions. You also need to make more DNA genomes to put in those new virions, so you have to replicate it. And so depending on which of these two classes of virus you are, the polymerase that does this is either host DNA polymerase or encoded in the viral genome, okay? That's pretty straightforward. So this convention here, of course, the, the DNA is in two shades of blue. The mRNA is always a light green. The protein is earth colors, as the artist said to us when we wrote the book. Uh, and that's the basic convention there. All right, so then the next class are the gapped uh, double-stranded DNA genomes. There's hep hepatitis B virus or hepatinoviridae. It's the only virus we'll talk about here. Um, these are unusual genomes, so it's about half double-stranded, but another, the other half is uh, gapped. There's no plus strand. There's just a single minus strand. There's also a protein. It's a viral protein covalently attached to the 5' prime end of the negative strand here, so there's a discontinuity in the minus strand right there. And finally, there's a little piece of RNA. That's the green attached to the plus strand. And why all this is like this, you will find out when we talk about uh, the replication of these viruses. All right, so this is the gap double-stranded DNA genome. These are reverse transcribing viruses. They go through an RNA intermediate. Yes? Yes, always, yeah. And again, you'll see why when we go through the mechanism of this. Okay, so... I've told you a couple of times that the gap DNA doesn't work to make mRNA. So that's something you have to remember. So the first thing these genomes do is they get into the cell, they get repaired and made double-stranded. So the gaps are filled in, the ends are ligated, the protein is removed, the RNA is removed, <clears throat> probably by host enzymes. So now we go from a gap DNA to a double-stranded DNA. And now you would say, well, it's probably mostly like uh, the DNA viruses, but there is an exception here because this virus encodes a reverse transcriptase. So the double-stranded DNA is copied to form a, a, an mRNA. Let's start with the mRNA first. That's up here. You can make protein from the mRNA and make new virions, of course. But to make new genomes, what the virus does, and this is very strange. I, I, we have no explanation other than it works. The virus uh, makes an RNA. It's the same RNA as the mRNA, except it uses it to make a DNA copy using reverse transcriptase, okay? So when you go from RNA to DNA, the enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. So now you go from a plus RNA to a minus DNA, by definition, uh, and then you make it partially double-stranded. 
ends up being that odd gapped molecule down here with the protein and the RNA and the gap, and that's this. And this is what gets packaged into virions. So it's unusual and, and uh, merits some thought because it's not obvious how this would go otherwise. Okay? All right, so that brings us to the last class of DNA, the single-stranded DNA genomes. And uh, these include two families, one of which is probably obscure to you, the circoviridae, circoviruses. Um, about probably 90 to 100 percent of you are seropositive for circoviruses. So we think these are among the viruses that don't hurt us. Um, in fact, some human vaccines contain circoviruses from animals in them, something we just discovered recently. They don't seem to hurt anyone. They do cause disease in animals of various sorts. And then the parvoviruses. So if you have a pet, you know you have to have the animal, the dog, uh, immunized against canine parvovirus. It's quite a serious disease. So these are both single-stranded uh, DNA genomes. These are very small viruses. They're packaged in an icosahedral shell. And they don't have the room to encode a DNA polymerase, so they use the host polymerase. The cellular DNA polymerase does everything. And so from that, you could probably guess that these DNAs have to get in the nucleus, because after all, that's where cellular DNA polymerase is, right? And that, that would be correct. So the flow of information, well, let's first look at the two genome types. The circoviruses have a circular single-stranded DNA genome. That's where the name comes from. It's very small. You can see 1.7 to 2.2, even smaller than the 5 KB genome of the uh, papillomaviruses that we talked about. And the one that you are all infected with is called TT virus. TT, Torquetenio, I think, is the abbreviation, ubiquitous human virus. The parvoviruses, which are also, also contain human pathogens, the B19 is the causative agent of fifth disease, is a parvovirus, and again, the canine parvovirus is part of this family. Uh, these have very unusual genomes. They're single-stranded linear genomes, but they can form these terminal T-shapes, which are important for replication, as you will hear. All right, so you have a circle and a single strand. So again, whether this is circular or single-stranded, it can't be made into message. You have to, first step has to be making a double-stranded intermediate, which can then be used to make mRNA and then protein. Yes? That's correct. So some of these viruses actually package randomly one or the other because it doesn't matter because what you need to do is make a double-stranded uh, DNA once it gets into the cell. So it doesn't matter what you start with. So you can see here, in fact, I'm showing both strands being packaged. Not in the same particle, but some particles have one or the other, and they both work. All right, so the information flow, you make it double-stranded, you make a messenger RNA. From that, you can make proteins for the virions. The DNA is then replicated by host systems, and the product of that are single strands. You'll hear about how that happens uh, from Dr. Silverstein, and the single strands get packaged. And for some of these viruses, they package both, either one or the other. Okay? Everybody okay so far? All right, that brings us to RNA genomes. Now, here the key is, and this factoid will really help you to remember that cells do not encode RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, okay? They cannot copy RNA viral genomes. So every RNA virus on the planet has to encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So that's very different from the DNA viruses, right? Remember, the small ones could use host DNA polymerase and uh, the bigger ones could encode their own. But RNA viruses all have to encode their own polymerase. So it's, it's an interesting evolutionary question why it evolved that way. You would think there would be negative uh, selection for carrying a gene for a polymerase, but it works because these viruses are actually very, very successful. These RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, this is how I uh, abbreviate them, RDRP, uh, these make, they do two things. They make mRNAs and they make new genomes for the viruses. They can do both. And, of course, the mRNA that they make has to be re readable by ribosomes so you can make protein. That's, tr that's obvious. All right, so the first uh, class is the double-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, 
there are quite a few of these, but there's only one we have to know about, and that's the rheoviruses or rheoviridae. Uh, this is a family that has a number of interesting viruses, but for us, the rotaviruses are the most important. These are major agents of human gastroenteritis, and these are one of the viruses that will make you sick. Typically in the winter, you get sick for three to four days, vomiting, gastroenteritis. That's one of the viruses that's doing it. There are a couple of others that do it as well, but this is one. And this is a big problem globally because babies tend to get them and get dehydrated and die if you're in a country that can't give you intravenous fluids. So we now have a vaccine that takes care of that. These are double-stranded RNA viruses. So among all the viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes, some of them have the genome in one piece or one molecule, but many of them have segmented genomes. So the real viruses have 10 to 12 double-stranded RNA segments in each virion. Okay? Another weird quirk, having a segmented genome, it just works. And you'll see this for other viruses as well. So real viruses have 10 to, have 10 to 12 double-stranded RNA. Here's an example of real virus, one of the viruses in this family. It has 11 double-stranded RNA segments. Uh, these RNA segments have a plus and a minus strand, of course. And this little blue box with the C, that signifies a cap structure. A cap is, of course, this interesting chemical group at the five prime end of mRNAs, which is important for their efficient translation. And this is actually present in the genome of these viruses. Now, again, just like gapped DNA or single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA can't be read by ribosomes. So even though there's a plus strand in here, it's not accessible. So what has to happen initially is that these uh, RNAs come in the cell and a virus-associated enzyme, that's an enzyme in the particle, makes an mRNA from the double-stranded genome. So here we encounter this interesting problem of whether or not an RNA virus will bring in the RDRP, the RNA polymerase, in its particle or not. So this is an example of one of them that has to have the enzyme in the particle because that double-stranded RNA can't be read by the cell. There's no enzyme in the cell to copy it, so the virus has to bring it in. All right? I'm going to see some examples of viruses that don't have to bring in this RNA polymerase in a moment. So the flow of information, the virus makes mRNA. It makes proteins from the mRNA that are needed to make virions and do other things in the infected cell. And then it takes some of those mRNAs and makes them double-stranded. It makes a negative strand, and now you have genome RNAs. And that's why these uh, genome RNAs have a cap in them because these mRNAs are all capped. It should, actually, all these mRNAs should have a little cap on them, but they don't. Uh, so to get good translation, you need a cap. And a subset of these mRNAs are eventually used to make genome RNAs. And so that's why they have a cap here. OK? So that is real virus. Everybody OK there? Yes? The double-stranded genome cannot be read by ribosomes. Even though it has a plus in it, it's inaccessible. So it has to be a free single-stranded plus-strand mRNA to be translated. It, I, I say that to explain why these can't be translated directly, because you may think, well, there's a plus strand there. Why can't, why isn't there an enzyme in the cell that unwinds it? Well, there isn't. Yes? Is there a system to ensure that every segment is incorporated into the area? Is there a system to make sure you get every segment in? S certainly. Do we know about it? <laughs> For some viruses, we do. We're going to talk about that later in packaging. Um, for some viruses, we know specific mechanisms that make sure that you get the right number of, of segments, yes. For other viruses, we're not sure what the mechanism is. But yeah, if you didn't have some, some mechanism, you would make a lot of non-infectious particles. All right, moving through the RNA viruses, plus-stranded, single-stranded RNA, single-stranded plus sense. We have eight families that infect mammals. Um, in my, including the picornaviruses, and the, among the picornas are polio, and you can remember them because that's my favorite virus, the polio virus, which I've worked on forever. Uh, also, rhinoviruses, or we are beginning to like rhinoviruses as well in my lab. Uh, 
So those are picornas. Those are, these are icosahedral viruses, this generic icosahedral shape. We have two viruses that cause gastroenteritis. <clears throat> we'll talk about the calices in some detail in the pathogenesis. This is another one you get at your age, you get vomiting and diarrhea. It's probably a calice. These are the cruise ship viruses. You go on a cruise ship, you get sick. It's most likely a calice. Yeah, and these are also, these are also these generic <clears throat> icosahedral viruses. Coronaviruses are very large viruses. They have the longest RNA genomes that we know of, almost 30 kilobases in length. And you probably would never have heard of any of these until SARS coronaviruses emerged a number of years ago and caused a pandemic globally. That's the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus. Uh, and then there are some obscure, the arteriviridae are, are mostly animal viruses we don't have to worry about. Flavy viruses are quite important human viruses. They include yellow fever, West Nile, and hepatitis C. And this is a diagram of a flavy virus. You see it has an envelope. And inside the envelope is an icosahedral capsid. So it's a virus like that with a membrane around it. Retroviruses, <clears throat> extremely important for our discussion. Reverse transcribing viruses with plus strand RNA genomes. The most famous, of course, HIV, which is shown here. And there are others we will talk about as well. And finally, toga viruses, rubella virus, important childhood pathogen, and uh, various encephalitis causing viruses. And these are diagrams of a toga virus. So both of the, uh, most, many of these viruses are enveloped, the coronas, the flavy viruses, the retroviruses, and the toga viruses that all have a lipid membrane, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Now, how do these viruses replicate? Uh, they start, you start with a plus strand genome. So a plus strand could, has the potential to be mRNA, right? You can't assume it is, but it could be. And in fact, for these viruses, that is what it is. The genome, the plus strand genome, is a messenger RNA. So it gets into a cell, it can be translated. So do these viruses need to bring in an RNA polymerase in the virion, do you think? Yes or no? No, they don't because they, could, they get translated, the genome is translated, and then among the translation products would be the viral polymerase. I want you to get used to that logic. It's re it really helps because if you have a plus strand genome and the first thing that happens is the genome is translated, you don't have to bring in an enzyme to do anything because it will be made among the first translation products. So those genomes are translated into protein. They're mRNAs. Uh, the protein, of course, eventually will be used to make new virions. Uh, it will also be used to replicate the genome. And to do that, you have to first make a minus copy, and then you use the minus copy to make more plus copies. OK? So genome, protein, genome, negative strand, plus strand, protein, or, or virion. These are diagrams of some of these genomes. You can see some of them are quite long. As I said, the coronas are the biggest. Flavi, picorna, toga. There are some interesting features here. Yes? Right. So the question is, if you have a, a long RNA genome, how do you access all the genetic information? That's, that is the subject of, a, of an entire other lecture. It's a very good question. There are a number of ways to get around it. There are about half a dozen ways that are used. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, there are a couple of features I want to pour out here. So many of these have a cap at the 5' prime end and a poly A tail. So those are features that are useful for efficient translation. But not all of them do. You don't have to know that flavies don't have a poly A. I'm just telling you that for your information. Picornas are unusual. They have a protein linked to the 5 prime end. And this protein plays a role in RNA replication. We'll talk about that later. And the togas also have a cap and a poly A tail at the 3 prime end. All right, any, any issues on this before we move on? All right, now we have a, a class of plus single-stranded RNA viruses that go through a DNA intermediate. So these are the retroviruses. There's one family, and we have two human pathogens, HIV-1, which is shown here, 
and human T lymphotropic virus HTLV, two human pathogens. And they go through a DNA intermediate. So what we have in the genome, so here's the exception that I was preparing you for. Here we have a virus with a plus-stranded RNA, but that RNA is not translated when it gets into the cell. It is copied into a DNA by reverse transcriptase. So what do you think? Do these viruses have reverse transcriptase in the particle or not? Yeah, I see some, some nodding heads. So yes, they do. Um, because they can't rely on reverse transcriptase being in a cell. Um, <clears throat> normally, cells don't have reverse transcriptase. In fact, many of our cells do because we have remnants of retroviruses in them. But a pristine cell that's never seen a retrovirus doesn't have reverse transcriptase, so the virus has to bring it in in the particle. So this is a bit paradoxical because it's a plus-stranded RNA, so you would think that it could be translated into protein, but it's not. And this is one exception you have to remember. This goes through a DNA intermediate. So the virus contains a reverse transcriptase. In fact, it's one of these proteins in the, in the virion here. It makes it first a negative strand DNA, and then it makes it double-stranded. And then that double-stranded DNA goes into the cell nucleus and integrates into your DNA. So both ends go into your DNA. There's an enzyme in the particle that we'll talk about that clips your host DNA and inserts the retroviral DNA and now becomes a permanent member of your host cell. And that virus DNA that's integrated in your genome is called a provirus. Okay, so that's a word you'll hear a lot too. Now this provirus that's sitting in the chromosomal DNA is now transcribed by host RNA polymerase to make mRNAs. So the virus doesn't encode its own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It uses the hosts because this provirus is sitting in your chromosomal DNA, which is being transcribed all the time. And wherever this inserts, it's eventually going to actually it carries its own promoter for DNA polymerase, and it uses the host enzyme to do that. So the mRNAs are made from that proviral DNA. And when I say proviral, you need to understand that that means integrated, right? So the mRNAs are made from proviral DNA by the host enzyme. <clears throat> of course, from the mRNA, we make proteins, which are involved in replication. We'll, we'll explore that in greater detail later. <clears throat> but we have to make more genomes. And remember, the genome is plus-stranded RNA. And that is, again, made by the host DNA polymerase. So some of those mRNAs that are made by transcription of proviral DNA are simply packaged into the host. So in a way, this virus doesn't actually replicate its own genome. The host replicates its genome, right? Because all the RNAs that get packaged are made by host DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Does everybody see that? The, the virus actually doesn't it only encodes this reverse transcriptase, which does this one step, makes a DNA copy, and then the host does the rest. It makes all the other genomes. So it's very unusual. Yes? Yes, good question. So is there a way to distinguish between mRNA and, and RNA that's going to be packaged? Yeah. And there are sequences that are spliced out from RNAs to, to be translated, and those, it, whenever those sequences remain, they get packaged, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. Right. Okay, those are retroviruses. And the last uh, family, well, among, among the last family are the negative strand RNA viruses, single-stranded RNA, of course, and we have a number of pretty scary viruses here. We have paramyxoviruses, which includes measles, and mumps virus. These are these big amorphous guys with a single RNA genome. We have rhabdoviruses, which include rabies virus. These are very characteristic. They're bullet-shaped. When I teach this to second and third graders, they like this the best because it's a bullet-shaped virus. <laughs> Don't know why. Then we have bornaviruses, rather small enveloped viruses. Phyloviruses, these include viruses you've probably heard of, Ebola virus and Marburg. They're very unusual. They're very long filamentous virus. This one's all coiled up here. Orthomyxoviruses, better known as influenza virus. 
This is this one here. You can recognize this because it has a segmented negative strand genome in, a, in an envelope. And finally, uh, arena viridae, which includes Lassa virus, and that's it right here. It's an envelope virus, but you can see it has two circular RNA genomes, very unusual. Now, Lassa virus was discovered in, 19, in the 1960s, and it's the subject of this book called Fever by John Fuller. And I, I, I put this here because I read this when I was in high school, and it's what made me want to be a virologist. That's why I'm here today, because of this book. So I'm very grateful. It's a great book, and it actually involves uh, Columbia University because a virologist who was at Yale at the time, he was working with this virus, which had come from Nigeria. And in those days, they used to mouth pipette, and he infected himself. So they brought him to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital <clears throat> to be taken care of. And it turned out that a nurse from Nigeria who had been sick had been flown to Columbia earlier. They had her serum. She recovered. So they gave this virologist her serum, and he lived. So that's all in this book. Did they make a movie of this, Saul? Do you remember? Was this the lousy Dustin Hoffman movie? No, that... <laughs> That was the Ebola movie. No, no. So they didn't make a movie of this one. There's a movie called Outbreak, which I think is a Dustin Hoffman movie, if I'm not certain, which is horrible. So don't watch that one. So anyway, Fever is cool. If you can find a copy, I, I recommend it. All right, so these negative strand viruses, negative strand RNA, yes or no, there's a polymerase in the virion. Yes or no? It's a negative strand RNA. Can the negative strand be translated? No. So what do you have to do? <clears throat> yeah, you've got to have a polymerase in the virion. You have to make a plus strand. So that's what happens here. Uh, you make a plus stranded RNA, which can be a message, make proteins. Then you have to replicate the genome. You go through a plus stranded intermediate. All right. The RNA polymerase that's encoded in the genome, it's also in the particle, but it's also encoded in the genome, makes the plus RNA, and it also makes minus RNA from the plus RNA. And we will explore this in more detail because we're going to have an entire lecture on RNA replication. Now, these viral genomes can be either segmented or in one piece. So here are the segmented genomes. The influenza viruses are an example of that. They have seven or eight segments, six to eight segments, depending on the virus. Each segment encodes one or two proteins. And the, are, are the others, the paramyxoviruses, measles, mumps, rabies virus, they have one RNA. And so this is an interesting problem, how to get many proteins from a negative strand RNA. So we will explore that later on. Now this um, segmented genome, which we've talked about for double-stranded RNA viruses and these single-stranded RNA viruses, has an advantage, and that's probably why it's, it's around, and that is the pieces uh, can easily be swapped between different viruses. So if two different viruses, two different flu viruses infect a single cell, uh, those viruses exchange their genomes. And basically you can have a new virus come out with eight segments or six to eight, whatever the number needs to be, which is a reassortant. Okay, so we call this reassortment. You get mixtures of segments from different influenza viruses or whatever virus has a segmented genome. This is one of the reasons flu is a bit daunting because influenza viruses infect virtually every animal on Earth, and there's a huge gene pool that's always reassorting in animals. And human strains infect animals, you get reassortment. So we are always wondering if some new strain is going to emerge to infect us. And that's what happened in 2009. A new strain emerged, which was a reassortant of human and pig and bird viruses. So we'll talk about that in more detail. But it happens because of this reassorted genome. It's very easy to mix the segments. Now, if you have a single RNA genome, you can still get recombination, which is mixing of sequences when the polymerase moves from one template to another. But that's harder. That's much less frequent. This is really high-frequency stuff. Now, one thing I want to tell you which is very interesting about some of the negative strand, we call them negative stranded RNA genomes, but they're actually ambisense. They have both plus and minus RNA. So the, the virologists decided to call them minus strand viruses although you could probably justify calling them plus strands. And those are the arena viruses, that's Lassa fever virus and Bunya viruses. So here's an example of the ambisense RNA genomes. Uh, these viruses have two RNA segments. 
a big and a large one and a small one. And you can see by the colors that the green part here, the light green is plus stranded and the dark green is minus stranded. All right, so um, what happens here is that <clears throat> these viruses, as they come into the cell, they're actually not translated directly. And that's, I think that's why they're called uh, minus strand RNA viruses. They actually bring in an RNA polymerase in the virion and that RNA polymerase uh, makes a small RNA complementary to the three prime end of one of, of each strand, essentially. So we're, we're looking just at the small strand here, the small genomic RNA. So this comes in with the virion. It comes in with an RNA polymerase. The polymerase makes a messenger RNA. That's a plus strand copy of this negative sequence. And from that, you can make proteins. And this, in the same way, when you copy this strand, this S genomic RNA, you make the antigenome, which instead of a plus minus, it now has a minus plus combination. And from this, the viral polymerase makes a mRNA, and from that it makes protein. Okay, so you never directly translate the genomic RNA. You make these little mRNAs to access the coding region here and here. Yes? So is G P plus and N P um, minus? Correct. And that in the genomic RNA it's that's right. G P is is the plus strand or the plus part of it and N P is the minus. So this is one RNA that is in the virion. And it, when it comes in with the polymerase, you make sub, well, we call these subgenomic mRNAs because they are not the complete genome. And again, no one really understands the evolutionary advantage of this, but it does seem to work. And so these viruses are very successful. All right, so this is a different way to look at all this information. If you like to uh, have these things organized in different ways, if that helps you. This is another way of arranging all seven genomes. I kind of like this because it has DNA viruses, RNA viruses, and the reverse transcribing viruses. And then it has the configuration of the genome. It tells you uh, what is present in the virion and then how you get to mRNA. So these are all the different pathways that we've talked about. It's very much like the Baltimore scheme except uh, just drawn in a different way. So you might find this more useful. If you study either one, you're going to be fine. Now, before we go on to some genetics, uh, all of the pictures I've shown you so far show these nice green squiggly lines. But of course, that's not what RNA genomes or even DNA genomes look like in the virion. They're often in very complex structures. So for example, uh, this is the genome of poliovirus, a plus stranded RNA genome. But in the virion, we think it looks like this. And this is all folded up into various stem loop structures. So here is actually the very five prime end of the RNA would be right here. And the, the RNA basically base pairs back on itself to form very stable structures. And this is actually generated by a computer trying to minimize the energy and it's a predicted structure. But we think that in the genome, in the virus particle, sorry, in the virus particle, that genomes look like this. And in fact, as we go through and talk about the different replication schemes, you'll find a ver a, an array of interesting structures that genomes uh, take on. So for example, um, the picornavirus genome, this is just part of the structure that I just showed you. It's folded up very extensively at one end. The hep B genome is very odd, as we've already said. Uh, the adenovirus genome has proteins linked to either end. Retroviral genomes are actually present in two copies in the virion, as you will see, and they're folded in this manner. And uh, retrovirus genomes, as we said before, have sequences that are important for packaging of the genome. And these sequences are stem loop structures, extensively base paired RNA. So although we use a convention to illustrate these genomes, I just want you to think that these are not simple lines in the virus particles. They're packaged in very specific ways. All right, for the rest of the time, I want to talk about genetic approaches that we use to study viruses, because we will refer to these throughout the remainder of the course. And one of the terms we use that I want to define so you know what I mean is wild type. So I'll say wild type influenza virus or wild type poliovirus. This just refers to an original strain from which we make mutants. Usually this is a laboratory strain. It's been it's been isolated from an animal years ago. We use it in the lab. We call it wild type because it's the basis from which we make anything. 
and it may not be the same as your original clinical isolate. It could be different. Uh, something you get from nature, if I isolate from one of you an influenza virus or a rhinovirus, you would call that a field or clinical isolate. For you, I would call it a clinical isolate. If, it were, if I went and caught a mouse and got a virus from the mouse, I would call it a field isolate. One, a, a technique that we use extensively in virology is called DNA-mediated transformation. This is the introduction of DNA, purified DNA, into cells. And don't confuse it with oncogenic transformation. Uh, that is something entirely different. It's a morphological transformation of cells. We'll talk about that as well. DNA-mediated transformation is, is put into cells. And the reason it's called transformation is based on the original experiments by Avery, McLeod, and McCarty at the Rockefeller in 1943 when they showed you could transform the colony morphology of a bacterium they used a pneumococcus in their experiments by putting DNA from one strain to another. So they said, we have transformed here, transformation of specific types. That word has stuck until today, transformation. So, but you have to say DNA-mediated transformation. Otherwise, we're not sure if you're talking about oncogenic transformation or not. So again, transformation of pneumococcal types from smooth to rough. They did this with DNA. That's why we call this DNA-mediated transformation. Now, another word that you'll hear is transfection. And what this is, is when you take a viral DNA and you put it in cells and you get virus out. So it comes from transformation infection. You use DNA-mediated transformation to start an infection. It was first done with lambda. They found years ago you could take the DNA out of lambda bacteriophage and put it onto bacteria and it would start an infection. Unfortunately, most people use the word transfection meaning to mean putting DNA, any DNA into cells because they don't like saying DNA-mediated transformation. It's too, too difficult, right? So you will hear transfection everywhere, and I don't mind if, if others use it, but I'm going to use it for a specific meaning in this class, which is putting a viral DNA into cells that's going to replicate. Okay? A mutation is a change in DNA or RNA. Do not tell me you mutated the influenza virus protein, because you don't mutate proteins. You change amino acids or you alter the sequence. A mutation is an action done on nucleic acid. It can be a base change or a deletion or a substitution, nonsense, missense, whatever you want, but it's only on nucleic acid. This method, the plaque assay, of course, uh, allowed us to do genetics with animal viruses, because for the first time we could pick a plaque. Remember, we discussed how you plaque purify viruses last time and genetically purify a virus and that allows you to do genetics. So starting in the 1950s we were able to do this. So when virologists were first able to do genetics they started trying to make mutants so they could study gene functions. You make all kinds of mutants. And how do you do this? Well this is the original way that virologists did it as you will see later, RNA viruses, when they replicate, make a lot of mistakes. Their polymerases are error prone. So I could give you a tube of poliovirus, and from it, you could probably select any mutant you wanted, just given the right selection. Let's say you wanted to make a heat resistant mutant. You could heat the tube and see what's left, and you would get some thermostable mutants out of that tube. DNA viruses have a much lower error polymerization rate, you can see here. So it's not as easy to get mutants from DNA viruses. And so what you do is you can treat them with chemicals that cause mutagenesis. And these are just some of them. You don't need to know these. Uh, chemicals like nitric acid, hydroxylamine, that modify the DNA and cause changes in base pairing, uh, base analogs that also intercalate and cause changes in DNA. So you would treat infected cells with these chemicals and then take what comes out and screen for your phenotype. So you're inducing changes in the DNA and looking for associated phenotypes. And what is a phenotype? Of course, it's something you can search for, like temperature sensitivity, the ability of a virus to grow at a high temperature or, or grow only at low temperatures. Plaque size is an easy one that people use all the time. Your virus makes nice big plaques on monolayers, so you mutagenize it and look for small plaques and then find out where the mutations are and what they do. Cold sensitivity, resistance to drugs, 
resistance to antibody, a change in host range. You'll adapt the virus to a different species and see what the mutations are. So these are just some of the phenotypes you could use to study it. Today, what we do if we want to make viral mutants, we don't have any of these chemicals anymore for the most part. We don't do mutagenesis. We have uh, DNA copies of virtually every virus genome and we can alter them. There are very specific methods to introduce mutations into the genome. So for most viruses, you can take a DNA copy of the genome and put it in a cell in one way or another and get virus out. So we call these infectious DNA clones. They are a validation of that, that Hersey Chase experiment where they said it was the DNA of the phage that was the genetic material. So now we're taking a purified DNA and putting it in cells and showing that it gives rise to virus. So you can make any mutation you want in, in DNA using restriction enzymes, PCR, and then get viruses with various phenotypes. So that's what we do nowadays. Let me give you two examples of how you would make virus from DNA. The first one is poliovirus. Polio has a plus strand RNA virus genome. If you extract this RNA from the virus particle and you transfect it into cells, what would you think? Would that RNA be infectious or not? Yes or no? Nodding. Okay, yes. It's a plus strand RNA. It can initiate infection. It goes in the cell. It's translated. It starts the infection. So that RNA is infectious. If you make a DNA copy of this RNA and clone it in a plasmid, you can then put that plasmid into cells and you get virus as well because there's a promoter in the plasmid that makes RNA when it gets into cells. Or you can make RNA in vitro from this plasmid using various enzymes and you basically make plus strand RNA, which you can put in. So you have this reagent. You want to delete a gene or you want to add a gene from another virus. It's very easy to do. And you can recover viruses uh, as you wish. Yes? So the, um, the protein of the 5' RNA, is that is it important for, <laughs> for um, any transfections? That's right. The protein at the 5' prime end is not required for infectivity of the RNA. It's required elsewhere in the genome, in the replication cycle, as you will see later. But yes, because this RNA that we make doesn't have a protein, so you don't need it. Right. OK, one more example. This is a really interesting one. This is influenza virus. So influenza virus has eight. The, the influenza viruses that we all worry about have eight strands or segments of negative strand RNA in the virion. In order to make a DNA copy of that genome, you have to take each of those strands and clone a DNA copy into a plasmid. So you have eight plasmids, which you then put in cells, and then you get influenza viruses out. And these, these plasmids are, are really very clever. I'm showing you the insert from one of these plasmids. So this plasmid has the viral sequence as DNA here in the middle. At one end, it has a Pol2 promoter. Pol2 is an enzyme in the cell that makes mRNA, right? So you put this plasmid in a cell, and you get mRNA produced from this Pol2 promoter, and that gives you viral proteins. At the other end of this plasmid is a Pol1 promoter. Pol1 makes smaller RNAs in the cell. It's a different promoter, different enzyme. From that, you make viral RNA, negative strand viral RNA. It's transcribing the other strand. So you get from the one plasmid, you get viral proteins, you get viral RNAs, and that gives you virus. So take eight plasmids, you put them in cells, and you get viruses out. So this is how you construct influenza viruses. Now, a very interesting experiment was done not too long ago with the 1918 influenza virus. Now, this virus, also known as Spanish influenza virus, caused a very serious pandemic. 50 to 100 million people died globally. And the thing is, we didn't have this virus up until a few years ago because we didn't isolate influenza viruses until 1933. And by then, this virus was, was gone. It was totally different. But what was done, so this is an example of what happened in 1918-19. People were just put into huge holding areas like this because they couldn't be accommodated by hospitals. It was very bad. So a number of years ago, a number of investigators went uh, and found pathology slides that the Army had stored from individuals who had died of influenza. They had taken sections from their lungs, 
they fixed them with formalin, put them in formald put them in paraffin and made sections. These guys went back and extracted RNA and determined the sequence of the influenza virus genome from these pathology specimens. This is amazing. They also went uh, up into Alaska, somewhere in the permafrost. I forgot, I think it was Alaska. There were victims who were buried and they had been frozen since 1918. They uncovered their graves, they did a biopsy of the lung and took out material from which they extracted RNA and they determined more viral sequence from it. And they took all this sequence of eight, all eight, plas all eight genome segments, put them into plasmids and recovered this virus. So we now have this 1918 virus that we can use to study uh, influenza and understand why it was so virulent. All right, the last thing I want to tell you about is that we can use viruses as vectors to correct human diseases, to do research, do all sorts of really interesting things. The one thing I want to tell you about today is uh, gene therapy. You have a patient who is missing a gene or has a mutation in the gene. You can restore the function by delivering the gene with a virus vector. We also use these uh, in, in the lab to do experiments as well. We can use them to make viral vaccines. Typically, for gene therapy, what you would like to do is take some cells out of the patient, put them in culture, infect them with the vector, and have expression of the protein that you want, and then put those cells back into the patient. It's, it's the preferred approach rather than infecting the individual with virus and hoping that it expresses the protein in the right place. Um, these vectors have to be able to accept a, a foreign gene. They can't kill you, of course, so you have to modify the vector to get rid of viral virulence, and you have to have a promoter driving your gene that gives you the right amount of protein. You don't want too little and you don't want too much, so these are not straightforward experiments to do. There are a number of human diseases shown here which are candidates for this kind of therapy, because here, here's the disease and here is the defect. For example, a severe combined immunodeficiency has a defect in adenosine deaminase, factor seven for hemophilia, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. So when you have a defined gen genetic disease, you can then take the gene, put it in a viral vector, and give it back to the patient. This is not easy to do, and there have not been a lot of successes, but it's being worked on in many different places. And one of the favorite vectors to be used, there are many, but one of the favorite vectors of gene therapy people is the retrovirus vector because it's really easy to take out most of the genetic information and have a lot of coding capacity. So what you typically do, so we, we don't know a lot yet about the biology of retroviruses, but I'll, maybe later on this will make sense to you. But what you do is you have two plasmids. If you take a plasmid encoding the viral capsid, which is this structure right here, and another one encoding uh, a glycoprotein, which are these guys sticking through the envelope. If you put these two plasmids in cells, they will make empty particles. So they will make a capsid, they will make an envelope with glycoproteins in it. So if you do the same experiment with a third plasmid where you have now a gene of choice, you want to restore a gene to a patient, you put the gene in here, you make sure you include the sequence that allows the RNA to be packaged into the retrovirus, you put these three plasmids in a cell, you now get a retrovirus containing your foreign gene. And then you can use this to infuse patient cells. Typically what's done is you take stem cells, you can take bone marrow or uh, blood derived stem cells, you culture them, you infect them with the retrovirus and once they're producing protein, then you put them back uh, into the patient. Yes? I'm sorry. Can you repeat it? Do they ever tailor these viruses to like specific No, they haven't done that. Right now they're just trying to <clears throat> take a disease where we know there's a, a defect and put a gene in that will complement the defect. The total number of patients, <laughs> the age is about 30. Yeah. There have been other approaches, and there have been other approaches too with other viruses, but we don't have time to go into that. The one, the one example I want to show you is this disease, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy. So this is a neurological disease. It's, you have a defective ABCD1 transporter. So we know the defect in a specific gene. And this is a disease that 
is very easy to diagnose. It, it's diagnosable in childhood. And what they have done here is done allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplantation. You take these cells out, you culture them, you infect them with a, a retrovirus that uh, encodes the protein. So they're called lentiviruses because they're derived from HIV-1, actually. So the vector is infecting the cells, the marrow-derived stem cells, uh, and then you put the gene-corrected cells back into the patients. And they showed in this study where they used two uh, kids, I believe, that they were able to correct uh, the defect. So this has a lot of promise, but of course it's very early days and one of the issues of course is that these viruses integrate into your DNA. And so a fraction of the time they may integrate into a gene that causes a mutation. And this actually happened in a French gene therapy trial through three, four Four out of five individuals in a French gene therapy trial a number of years ago developed tumors because the retrovirus integrated next to an oncogene. So it's promising, but we have some time to go.